I always go back and forth on the closing chapel. I generally get this um, last chapel service. I know finals are done. The anticipation of see you, have a nice day is in your mind. And right now you just feel like I just want to go sleep <laughs> uh, or do something other than sit in chapel. But I, So I ask the Lord to just kind of help me give you something that uh, you can leave with that will challenge you uh, for this Christmas season. And so we'll look at Luke chapter 2 in just a moment. Would you pray with me and for me as we look at the text today? Lord, we need you. Thank you for the opportunity to look at your word regularly in a chapel setting and to hear your word taught and preached. And I pray that you would help me this morning to be a blessing. And uh, Lord, would you... Just keep us alert. I know as we've wrapped things up with the college semester and um, a lot of work and finals and projects have been done, that you would just uh, help us to look to tonight to see a, a special evening as far as the concert's concerned, uh, to see guests come out. And Lord, we just be able to wrap up our time here this semester pleasing you. And as the high school finishes up on Friday, God, would you help them as they start their finals tomorrow that they would finish well also. The devil's good at discouraging. At a time like this, he knows how to get people discouraged. And so I just pray that we'd have victory over the devil. Thank you again for the opportunity to come and be a part of this chapel setting. I ask you to help me in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you can remember the best Christmas that you have ever had. I, I was trying to think through this, trying to think of my best. Now, they start to blend together after a while, after celebrating 45 Christmases. So I don't know if the one I'll share with you is the best, but I will share what is most memorable for me. I was, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years old. I don't remember. My dad worked at United States Steelworks over in Gary, Indiana. And right before Christmas, not, not long before Christmas, he got laid off from his job. And I'll never forget him kind of rounding up the troops at home and saying, kids, this is not going to be a very good Christmas. Now, he was not a Christian at the time, but I remember him saying, this is not going to be a very good Christmas. We're not going to get a lot of gifts for you all this year. And for a seven, eight-year-old boy, that's pretty disheartening. It was a letdown. And I don't know how it all kind of came together, but I remember people in our church just went crazy for us. They just started bringing boxes of food. They started knocking on the doors, and then they would disappear. So a lot of anonymous gifts. And I'll never forget, um, we went to the door one time. Someone had knocked, went to the door, and there was just a, a pile of gifts. And I, I remember just kind of when we'd start to hear that door knock, I wanted to run and see who it was because we wanted to show our appreciation, show our gratitude. A lot of times we got frustrated because they were gone. And I'll never forget seeing cars disappear out of the driveway like, I wonder who that was. I wonder who that was. But I remember that year getting a game called Electric Football. This is going to date me a little bit, all right? Uh, we didn't have to deal with video games and all that stuff back in those days. But it was a game about yay long, about yay wide. And you had these little characters, little plastic characters. And you'd have to break them off, kind of like a model, if you will. Those models you put together, you had to break them off. Slide them into these little green vibrating things. And so we'd put them on, you'd kind of set the team up, and you'd click the switch, and the whole board would zzzz, and the guys would just kind of like. <laughs> and that was so cool to me. I mean, that was, I think I played with that until I was 16 or 17 years old. And you had these little pieces of sponge. They didn't even make them into footballs for you. You had to tear out the sponge and put it underneath the guy's arm. So every play, you'd gather the guys in their huddle, move the uh, football or the sponge into the other guy's arm, and you know, then their arms would be breaking off over the years, and you kind of like, try it was just, it was a blast. But I, I remember, I don't know what's happening here. I remember just that Christmas. It was very memorable for me. There were other Christmases I don't necessarily want to remember. You might have had a Christmas at this point that a lost loved one was not there for the first year. And you just kind of sat there, and there was that 
open seat, if you will, in the memory. And, and so, so I'm, I'm not trying to depress them. I'm trying to think of Christmas. And with today, I'd like to give you a, a Christmas, Christmas challenge, Christmas encouragement. Obviously, wish lists have changed. It was real simple back in our day. It's like, what do you want for Christmas? You didn't ask because you already knew you were going to get socks. You already knew you were going to get a sweater. <laughs> That's probably why I don't like sweaters to today. I just don't like sweaters because I got so many back in the day. Uh, a book and a ball. That was the four things that I pretty much got every Christmas. And uh, now it's just, it's obviously, it's changed. We're in the technology era. Uh, we didn't have those options. It was like, what kind of phone do you want? What coverage do you want? And blah, blah, blah. And so now things are just different. When I got my first phone, I was, I'm trying to think. I was married. I think we had been married three or four years. Um, Gideon was about to be born, and I got home from the bus route, four or five o'clock Saturday afternoon, went home. I didn't see my wife around. I just kind of goofed around at the house for a little bit. I thought, well, I wonder if she's at. I went down to church, and I remember Mrs. Armacross said, did she have the baby? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> We had no way to communicate. It was just life was way simpler, more simple that, back in those days. But I remember getting my first phone, and it was a flip phone, I think, and, and just life was pretty simple. But then as things have progressed, you guys walk around, you're, it's just with you all the time. It's part of your body. But if I were to say, what is good coverage for a phone? This is like not even in my vocabulary. If I would say, hey, I got 3G coverage, you're laughing, right? I didn't really even know what that meant till today. I was looking like, you know, I was talking, I've heard these things. What does that mean? And my understanding is in 2022, there's going to be certain phone companies that won't even offer devices that have 3G coverage at all because it's just gone. That's how simple it is. It's just, in my mind, it's okay. But in your mind, you're like, weak, loser, um, not that long ago, it was, it was pretty decent coverage. Now it's maybe even just average. What I'd like to encourage you is this Christmas, at least, at best, have a 3G Christmas. Okay, it's, I, I'd like you to encourage you to have a 5G Christmas, and you'll see where I'm going with this. But two of these are going to be up to you. Three I'm going to kind of put on you to just have, at best, a mediocre Christmas. Luke chapter 2, let's get there. It says in verse number 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. There's a song people will sing Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year. But some people will have a terrible Christmas. They will drown themselves in the drink and completely skip out on thinking of the son of David. Money. I was talking to our referee last night. He said, man, sometimes Christmas just gets so crazy and so confusing, and there's all this, and you got to get presents for them and get presents for them, and sometimes it's just not even enjoyable. And he's like, I just want to get back to a simple, enjoyable Christmas. You know, money will mellow our hearts when it comes to thinking of the Messiah. And toys and technology condemn the truth that has come to us. I'm so thankful that Jesus came. And when he came, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Can we not get excited about Christmas? Simple 3G Christmas, number one. The wonder of Christmas moved the angels to glory. 
If you're going to have a mediocre Christmas, can I encourage you, start to glorify God. The angels came down to these shepherds that were sitting out there in the fields and they simply brought a message. Hey, Jesus has come. We're going to give glory to God in the highest. Someone said it this way. Some men become proud and insolent because they ride a fine horse, wear a feather in their hat or are dressed in a fine suit of clothes. Who does not see the folly of this? If there be any glory in such things, the glory belongs to the horse, the bird, and the tailor. But we walk around as if we deserve the glory. May I remind you, he is the creator. We are the creature. And when we stop and dwell on the grace of God, I tell you what, we need to make sure the glory is going to the proper place. And this Christmas, you'll have at least, or at best, just a simple, mediocre Christmas when you come to the fact, come to the understanding, I just need to glorify the Lord. Can we not get excited anymore over the grace of God? Turn over to Galatians chapter 2. This verse really kind of gripped me as I was thinking about the grace of God. How many of you have ever been frustrated? When I was on the wrestling team many moons ago, Mr. Wright would come into the room, and you could tell he was having a good day. And he'd have us kind of on the wall getting ready to do sprints, and he'd have that whistle around his neck, and he kind of, it would be, it would be on, in his mouth, and then you knew he was about ready to get onto us for something because the whistle would just free fall. <laughs> And it was almost like that was the moment you better just hone in. And he'd walk along, and I, I, I can remember it like it was yesterday, because he would push us, and he would do, make us do all these moves, and we just, it wasn't happening. And he would say, guys, I am so, and he couldn't even say the word right. He said, I am frustrated. <laughs> and he would take his hand, and he would just like hit me right here. And he just hit me in the chest. Eric, I'm just frustrated with you. I'm so frustrated with you. I'm frustrated. I still think about that often. I'm like, could you just say it right? <laughs> I got the point. But that word frustration is our, our definition would be the feeling of being upset or annoyed because of the inability to change or achieve something. Look at verse 21 of Galatians chapter 2. Paul is writing. I don't think I'm taking this out of context because I just want to talk about this for a moment. But Paul says this, I do not frustrate the grace of God. And I, I'm trying to wrap my mind around that because here's a coach in my world trying to achieve something, trying to achieve progress and success. And it kind of, because he was unable to, he was frustrated. Can I say it this way? God's grace is all around us. There's, there's a whole well of it. And God just says, I just want to give. And 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 can I remind you, there's a purpose in the grace of God. Read Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and following. It says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this presence present world. Why should we live pure? Why should we live clean? Because of the grace of God. And there's a purpose, and I wonder today as God looks down at my life, if, and I'm not trying to be hyper, uh, negative towards God, but I wonder if in the same way he's kind of taking his holy fingers and he's hitting my chest and Eric, I'm frustrated with you. I'm frustrated. You frustrated my grace. There's a purpose and you've annoyed it. You haven't allowed it to achieve what it wants to achieve. I'm, gl I'm glad we live under grace. This is a really good illustration, and I, 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 I do want to share it, because sometimes we struggle with this law versus grace, but I think it's very fitting when we think about giving God glory for His grace. H.A. Ironside gives the illustration. He says this, some years ago, I had a little school for young Indian men and women who came to my home in Oakland, California. They came from various tribes in northern Arizona. One of these was a Navajo young man of unusually keen intelligence. 
One Sunday evening, you went with me to our young people's meeting. They were talking about the epistle to the Galatians, and the special subject was law and grace. They weren't very clear about it. And finally, one turned to the Indian and said, I wonder whether our Indian friend has anything to say about this. This young man rose to his feet and said, well, my friends, I've been listening very carefully because I'm here to learn all I can in order to take it back to my people. I do not understand all that you are talking about. I do not think you do yourselves. But concerning this law and grace business, let me see if I can make it clear. I think it is like this. When Mr. Ironside brought me from my home, we took the longest railroad journey I ever took. We got out at, at the uh, st station and I saw the most beautiful railroad station and hotel I've ever seen. I walked all around and saw it one in a sign, do not spit here. I looked at that sign and then I looked down at the ground and saw many had spitted there. And before I think what I am doing, I have spitted myself. Isn't that strange when, the, strange when the signs say, do not spit here? I come to Oakland and go to the home of the lady who invited me to dinner today, and I'm in the nicest home I have been in. Such beautiful furniture and carpets. I hate to step on them. I sank into a comfortable chair, and the lady said, now, John, you sit here while I go and see whether the maid has dinner ready. I look around at the beautiful pictures, the grand piano. I walk all around those rooms. I am looking for a sign, and the sign I'm looking for is, do not spit here. But I look around those two beautiful drawing rooms and cannot find a sign like this. I think, what a pity when this is such a beautiful home to have people spitting all over it. Too bad they don't put up a sign. So I look all over the carpet, but cannot find that anybody have spitted there. What an odd thing. Where the sign says, do not spit, people spitted. When there was no sign at all in that beautiful home, nobody spitted. Now I understand, he said. That sign is law, but inside the home, it's grace. They love their beautiful home, and they want to keep it clean. They do not need a sign to tell them so. I think that explains the law and grace business. I read that because before salvation, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And the things that I would, I do not. And the things that I would not, that I do. And there's this law. Of you know what that is? That's under law. But watch me. When grace came, there should be just something in me that just wells up to say, wow, I just love God. I just need to glory in his grace. I don't have to be told not to look at dirt. I don't have to be told not to do the wrong things. And, and sometimes the grace of God just showers all over us. And yet we frustrate the grace of God. I think it'd be a good Christmas if we started with just simply giving glory to God. Can we not get excited about his grace? Number two, the wonders of Christmas moved the shepherds to get up and go. Look at verse 15. And it came to pass that the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another. Let me go back. These angels began to glory. Now watch me. It got contagious. COVID. I just got to throw it in there. Because everybody's so concerned about COVID, right? It's contagious and don't breathe on them and stay away from them and all this social distancing. Can I flip it around? Man, it'd be a blessing if some of us got, got to glorifying God a little bit and it just started spreading. God's name is cussed and it drives me crazy. I was blessed last night. I encouraged the guys to hand out tracks to these young men at the wrestling tournament. I watch these guys walking out of the gym reading Amazing Grace tracks. Amen. You know what? When one starts doing right, it can become contagious. It doesn't always have to be negative. The angels start glorying, and we're going to see here in just a moment, the shepherds start glorying, but not only do they glorify God, they get up and do something. Let me encourage you. You look through the scriptures, you find a lot of times when God's men were sitting, it, did, it wasn't a good situation. And I'm not saying uh, that we say, well, Jesus told Martha that Mary chosen the good part to sit. Well, the problem is when we're sitting, we're not generally at the feet of Jesus. It'd be a good thing this Christmas not to just, watch me, not to just sit around and here's your chairman and veg. I, I'm all for resting, 
But I tell you what, you can go back to your home church. You can get busy. Say, sign me up. I'm here for four weeks or five weeks or whatever it is. Sign me up for something and watch me. Go in there, make a difference. And I'll tell you what, your Christmas will be way better when you get up and go and not just sit down. And the shepherds heard this message, and, and they're sitting there, and they were probably interrupted. They were probably resting peacefully. And here comes these angels lighting up the sky, and they, they, they had the choice to say, you know what, let's just sit. I don't know what that was all about. That was a little extreme. But no, you know what they did? They got up and went. If you're going to have a good Christmas, I think it's a good, a good idea to get up and go. Let me go a step further, because I am very ashamed about this. I was with a pastor not sun, this past Sunday, the Sunday before, and we were talking, and soul winning came up. He says, man, Eric, I, I have been door knocking this year, and she's like, oh, I've only led 20 people to Christ this year. I said, I thought, we need to change the subject. Because if he asked me, Get ashamed. I kind of had the thought, I wonder if amongst this group, all of us collectively, if we could say we've led 20 people to the Lord. I don't know. I hope so. But I can guarantee this. When you lead somebody to Jesus, when you get up and go, you're going to be pretty excited about it. I hear a lot of vocabulary talking about this and that and this. I don't hear a whole lot of speaking about, let's get up and tell people about Jesus. Is that not our purpose, is to see people come to know Jesus Christ as Savior? Now, I'm preaching to me, so don't look. I'm not being rude and crude. I'm just saying, this is, it was very convicting to me because I'm thinking, oh, I better hang my head. I got to get out of here because I'm feeling real convicted. I'm just going to put it out there. I, I want next semester some of you to join me. We just need to go out and hit doors. We need to get out to reach people. And I'll tell you what, this Christmas will be good if you can come back and say, man, I got to lead somebody to Jesus. That'll be an exciting Christmas. You sit back and you watch YouTube videos and watch a whole bunch of nonsense and you do nothing. It won't be a good Christmas for you. I'm just trying to help you to at least have a mediocre Christmas. Start to glorify God. Just lift them up. Just go up to somebody. Let me tell you about Jesus. They're going to look to you a little strange. And then get up and, and go. Number three. This is pretty obvious, I think, but the wonder of Christmas moved the wise men to give. Glory, go, give. Jesus said it best, it's more blessed. I'll tell you my frust frustration, if I can use Mr. Wright's uh, terminology. I get frustrated when I don't know what people want. I think I've asked my wife 10 times, what do you want? I don't know. And I've looked all over Walmart. I don't see, I don't know. I've looked for whatever. I've looked for these things and I don't see them on the shelves. And it, it's really where I'm at now. People say, my kids know if they say, what do you want for Christmas? Where's Marissa? What do I say? Go ahead, lay it on me. What do, I, what, do, what, do I, what do I say? Obedient kids. That's all I want. And Gideon's like, hey, ain't ever going to happen, so you might as well stop asking for it. <laughs> but, but obviously, my desires on this side are to, I just enjoy giving. It's really a lot of fun to give. But it's frustrating when you don't know what to get for the people that you want to give. Now watch me. You can look through the scriptures. and Here's my challenge. Put a list down of things that you can give to Jesus. You know, Christmas offering, that's easy. You guys are loaded. I know you don't think you are. You're spending money on Dunkin's and Starbucks and all these things. I see you coming like, they're loaded. But it's pretty easy to throw a little chunk in the offering plate for Christmas offering, and we ought to. But I think there's other things if we just put our mind to it that we can... Be creative enough to say, I just want to do something for Jesus this year. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Once a man said, if I had some extra money, I'd give it to God. But I have just enough to support myself and my family. And the same man said, if I had some extra time, I'd give it to God. But every minute is taken up with my job, my family, my 
clubs and what have you, every single minute. And the same man said, if I had a talent, I'd give it to God, but I have no lovely voice. I have no special skill. I've never been able to lead a group. I can't think cleverly or quickly the way I'd like to. And God was touched. And though it was unlike him, God gave that man money, time, and a glorious talent. And then he waited and waited and waited. And then after a while, he shrugged his shoulders and he took all those things right back from the man, the money, the time, and the talent. After a while, the man sighed and said, if I only had some of that money back, I'd give it to God. If I only had some of that time, I'd give it to God. If I could rediscover that glorious talent, I'd give it to God. And God said, oh, shut up. And the man said this, you know, I'm not sure that I believe in God anymore. The ministry you were in this year, was it a checklist? Because through the ministry you are giving to God, the scripture says if you just take a cup of water and give it to someone, watch me, in my name, it is as if you are doing it for God. That ought to excite us. I can bless God. I can be a help to God. Little me. And if you just want to have a 3G Christmas, can I encourage you? Lift up his name. Let me glorify God. Let me tell you about his grace. How about this? The next four or five weeks, just get up and go. Go find someone to help. Be that anonymous person dropping off a box. But I want people to recognize me. We've, we've missed the motive. We have wrong motives. It is fun being a sneak and doing right. I get frustrated because every day, oh, this high school guy got in trouble and this one's, that's frustrating. But how about we sneak around and do good? Let's get up and go. Let's, let's, let's go home and make a difference in your church and say, I want to bless God. People are going to look at you like, what is wrong with that? I guarantee you, you'll have a good Christmas. Glory. Go and give. 3G Christmas. Watch me. The coverage is small. You have the option to find a couple more G and make beyond average coverage. It's up to you. 3G Christmas. Hope it helps. Lord, use this I ask. Thank you for the attention that's been given. Bless this invitation. In Christ's name. Amen.